morning. I'm here to share my, uh, our experience with the camera, Cornell Inley. These are my financial disclosures. So the AccuFocus camera inlay uh, has had over 17,000 inlays implanted worldwide. And during these times, 11 ophthalmologists have actually had the inlay implanted in their eyes. Very impressive that many of some, these are some of the investigators of AccuFocus and they volunteer to have an inlay in their eye because they see the outcomes. Three optometrists also have the inlay in their eye, and it's commercially av available in 47 countries all over the world. The, the camera design is such that there is an opening in the middle that's sized 1.6 millimeters, and the inlay is a disc, which is total diameter is 3.8 millimeter. It works via depth of focus through a pinhole effect, and this in aids in explaining to the patients what the inlay can do. So in terms of depth of focus, this is a simulation wherein if you see the targets on the right, those with presbyopia but without any correction will see a limited amount of cards in this stack of cards. But if you put an inlay or you put, make the aperture smaller as in a camera, your depth of focus increases. You see more from near to the point where you see distance. So you expand the range of vision of the patient. We have evolved into several kinds of combinations of camera inlay implantation. The first one on the left is a pocket emetrope corn camera. So when we implant a camera inlay, you can choose to implant it under a flap or in through a corneal pocket. And this procedure we do on emetropes only. The second column is combined LASIK camera wherein we can do LASIK first, correct the refractive error. We do camera in one eye only. So in that eye, we leave a residual myopic error of minus 0.75. Then you put the camera on the eye and you close the flap. On the third level, third column, is a post-LASIK camera. So some of your patients have had LASIK thin flap. So you cannot put the camera in a thin flap. The recommendation is at least 180 to 200 microns deep. So in the third column, we create a tunnel 100 microns under the flap interface. So under the previous flap, 100 microns, and then put the camera. And in the last column, you plan flap, do the LASIK, then wait a while, wait a month, then put the camera under 100 microns under the inlay. So these are four different categories of surgical techniques to choose from. And it's up to the doctor to choose which one they're more comfortable with. So for the first column, they're for emetropes. Second column, they're for those with, with refractive errors, third column, post-LASIK, and the fourth column, combination. So, uh, overall, there have been mo uh, more than 10,000 procedures, and in this uh, series of 7,500 procedures, at one year, this is the distribution of cases that have been done. So, most patients who come in the Japan clinic, where this is very famous, do the combined LASIK because they have refractive errors and they want presbyopia correction at the same time. Near vision uncorrected across all procedures, across all the four types, show that near vision is close to J2 to J1 in after 12 months. Distance vision is maintained at close to 2020, also at 12 months. Even if you leave minus 0.75 diopter residual refractive error, because of the pinhole effect, it actually creates a depth of focus and improves the distance vision as well. Contrast sensitivity for both photopic and mesopic are within normal. Tasks, near vision tasks as a reading, a book. So this chart shows you the tasks done on the left column in dim light, on the right side on daylight, and the green is pre-op. They have limited near vision tasks, but after inlay, the blue, the blue web shows you how much they improved going out. So they find it very easy to do these tasks. In terms of distance vision, pre-op is the green, post-op is the blue, and there's not much sacrifice in distance vision tasks after putting the inlay. We 
also checked reading speed and we showed that reading speed was faster, reading acuity was better, and the reading distance now is closer to the face. So before uh, the inlay, 48 centimeters, after the inlay, close to 40 cm. Other, other children that have been asked is, does this affect testing for visual field? It does not. We've done um, Humphrey tests on these patients and there was no scotoma around where the inlay should be. There have been cataract surgeries done with the inlay. It's very interesting to see it. The patients do the FACO without removing the inlay. At least be very careful, but they see the periphery as long as the pupil is very much dilated. One good thing about inlays is, is they are removable and they are movable in case you are off center you can move it but if you are on target on center if the patient is not happy in any way you can remove the inlay one other thing is corneal safety because we don't want any melts we don't want to compromise the health of the cornea the 8,400 perforations or holes allow for nutrient flow, so there are no melts as long as you implant it at least 180 microns deep. These are tests on the endothelium. We check um, specular microscopy, confocal microscopy, and OCT, which shows that the eye is pretty, the cornea is pretty much quiet after. So, in summary. After 17,000 inlays to date, with 11 ophthalmologists, we've shown that improvement in near vision acuity is good. They're very functional, even with one eye, patients are functional. Of course, not as perfect as a bilateral treatment, but definite improvement. Minimal effect on distance vision, patients drive without any difficulty. Results are maintained, so the study I've done it for three and a half years, and so far the patients are good. And the design does not interfere with ocular assessments and secondary surgical procedures. Thank you.